Today's show, we're talking about information technology equipment. And for you acronym buffs, that's ITE. What is it? What is an ITE room? What's Article 645? We're diving into all those subjects in today's show. Don't hang up that phone. We found what you're looking for. Welcome to the Let's Talk Cabling Podcast with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Well, seeing how we're pulling Category 6A, the most powerful twisted pair in the world. You gotta ask yourself this one question. Did I pull 295 or 300 feet? Well, do you feel lucky? Do you punk? In this podcast, you'll learn the differences between a 66 and 110 punch tool, the proper way to install a support cable, along with testing and certifying the cable. What exactly does RCDD stand for? Registered Communications Distribution Designer. Just the expert, you need to ensure your cable plant performs exactly as designed. The elite professional, knowledgeable, and experienced in leading edge ICT design principles. So join us as we talk about the ever-changing world of telecommunications. From ISP to OSP, from copper to fiber, design to installation. Now, send the new guy to the truck for a bucket of dial tone and the cable stretchers while you listen to an informative program on telecommunications. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, project managers, estimators, IT personnel. We are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new shows are being published? If you're listening to this on podcast shows uh, such as iTunes or Google or one of those others, would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? And if it's not a five-star rating, shoot me an email. Tell me what I need to do to make it a five-star rating. Those simple steps will help us get information out there so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of everybody in this industry. Also, every Thursday night, 6 p.m., live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, our after hours Ask Chuck Bowser RCDD, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD that question that you have just been trying to figure out the answer to. Pretty popular show, so submit your questions early. Send them to questions at letstalkcabling.com. But I know I can hear you now. Chuck, I'm driving home at Thursday night at 6 p.m. I can't watch a video in the car. I gotcha. They're recorded. Yeah. So all you gotta do is go to our webpage, let's talk and you'll find all of the audio podcasts, all of the YouTube videos, all there for your consumption at your convenience. So let's get on with the show. So Article 645, information technology equipment. You know what that means? It means we're bringing back our resident code expert, Tim Coleman. Tim, how are you doing, buddy? Doing good, Chuck. Doing good. It's been a while since I've seen you. It's it's been a couple of weeks, hasn't it? It has been. It has been. And you are now officially the guest who has been on the show the most. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's either good or that's bad, depending on how you want to look at that. I'm, I'm looking you. at the positive, Chuck. I'm looking at the positive. There you go. There you go. So I'm assuming that you're pretty familiar with Article 645, Information Technology Equipment. Um, I will be. I will forewarn you that that's one of the sections of the code book that Chuck knows very little about. So I'm prepared. I got my pen. I got my paper to take notes. I'm ready to rock and roll with this. I'm, I know every time I talk to you, you teach me something new, and that's. It's almost trying to learn something new every day. But let me ask. Let me start with the most obvious question about Article 645. Does it apply to a telecom room? No, but it can. So when they're talking about an information technology equipment room, uh, at least from a code perspective, they're not talking about a TR, a telecom room. Remember, telecom rooms, we primarily do data transport. When you're talking about an information technology equipment room, you're talking about a room that, from the, as the way the code interprets it, does data processing. And those two are different. You know, with data transport, um, if you lose your transport, you know, you have people sitting around and they can't communicate or they get an error message. In fact, just the last couple of days, there was a small internet outage. And so all of us, all of us working from home had, had problems reaching some of our services. But when you have a problem with data processing, that's a much bigger difference. You know, so those cyber attacks, you know, that affected some of these companies here not too long ago, 
They couldn't get to their corporate data. That literally shuts down the operation of the entire company. That's a huge financial loss. So what you have is Article 645 that deals with the cabling, the electrical circuits in an in a, in a information technology equipment room. And then you have a companion NFP article, NFPA article, NFPA 75, that deals with uh, dealing with the risks associated with a data processing or I should say uh, information technology equipment room. And so really when you look at those, you, you kind of work with them hand in hand. You know, I've, I've always said when it comes to definitions, the definitions that count are the ones that are in the code. You know, uh, you can't necessarily apply TIA definitions to electrical code or Bixie definitions to electrical code because you got to work within the code language itself. In this case here, NFPA has done an excellent job, in, in, in my opinion, of making sure definitions from, from one NFPA document also work well with other NFPA documents. And so that's what we see here is when you start reading Article um, 645, you see immediately there's a small informational note that says refer to NFPA 75. And when you read NFPA 75, that's where, well, it's not easy to find, but that's where you actually find what the definition of an information technology equipment room is. And I'd hate to say it's not in the definition section. If you read the, you have to go back to the origin statement. I know it's the prologue. It's the, it's all the fluff they put at the very beginning of the document. Uh, and I have it in front of me here so I can, I can read it. it please it do, says, please do. It says, in additions of this standard prior to 2003, the terms electronic computer slash data processing equipment and electronic computer systems were used where the current terms information technology equipment and information technology equipment system respectively are used. Similarly, the terms computer room and computer area were replaced by information technology equipment room and information technology equipment area respectively. So basically what the NFPA is telling us is that we have replaced the term computer room with information technology equipment room or computer equipment with information technology equipment. I'm glad you pointed that out because when, uh, when in my prep for this show, I actually went to article 645 and I read the, the very first paragraph that talks about the intent of that particular article and stuff. And it mentions ITE and IT equipment. And then I went to the, because usually right after that scope statement, it usually has the definitions for that section. Wasn't there. I went to Article 100, wasn't there. And I'm like, what the heck? Now, I did see the NFPA uh, informational notes there, um, but I didn't have time to look that up before the show. So I'm glad that you actually mentioned that those definitions, because I am one of them people that, you know, words have specific meanings yep. and use the right word for whatever you're trying to describe, because it helps clear up any ambiguity so there's no misunderstanding between people. Communications is, is going to be critical. So, so the, in the uh, what is the ITE in the room that Article 6045 is actually referring to? You said it was the computer room? It's a, basically a data processing room or a computer room, or what we would call uh, the space within a building that we would also refer to uh, in common terms as the data center. Okay. So it's where all our servers are. And yes, you can still have data transport equipment, switches and routers. In fact, you have to have those in your server room, but a TR or the telecom room that we typically put, you know, the old fashioned term IDF, uh, those rooms that we use the data transport to get back and forth from your workstation all the way back to the computer room, all those TRs are for data transport. Those are not data processing. And there's even a section in NFP 75 that says, even if the mere presence of a data processing equipment, say you put a terminal server in, or a, you do put a small server in a telecom room, that mere presence of that server in that room doesn't necessarily invoke the requirements of that standard. Now, doesn't mean that you couldn't apply NFPA uh, or Article 645, in, in some uh, circumstances where there's critical communications, uh, NFPA 75 actually says for telecommunication spaces, you should consider to reduce your risk to build uh, to the requirements of NFPA 75 and Article 645. So there are certain cases, say for you have a nurse call system in a hospital. Uh, one, 
And a PA 75 says from a risk standpoint, you may want to do that. And there's probably jurisdictions that would also interpret that you have to build a room with uh, the same requirements that Article 645 uh, states out. So is that a, is it, so I guess let me ask a question. Is it an easy way as a as a as a, a quick check to figure out if something falls under 645 is you ask yourself, does is this just transporting the data or is it actually processing the data? Right. And everything we do from a telecom standpoint, Dixie, I mean, I would say is primarily built around data transport, right? right. Communication transport, data transport. Uh, it's uh, we do have data center standards, but data centers, you know, truly are are a unique animal in, unto themselves. Right. Well, remember one of the acronyms that we used to use to describe our cabling was ITS, Information Transport Systems, until they changed it to ICT. So I guess that kind of keys in with that. I guess somebody picked up on that and and actually thought ahead of time to really name it correctly, and then they changed it. So and there we go. Our entry loves acronyms almost as much as it loves changing acronyms. So let me ask you this, if I build out an information technology equipment room, are there any specific requirements that I have to follow to so make sure it, it, it's gonna be classified as an ITE equipment room? Yes and no. Here's the thing, uh, I, would, I would question that question in that, you know, it really comes down to, do I have to build a room to uh, information technology equipment room to article 645? And the answer is no. Now, they're just, uh, let me preface, the, preface that by saying a jurisdiction might say, no, you have to build it to 645, it's mandatory. But 645 is written to say, I have this unique space, it's a, it's a computer room. And because of the nature of the computer room with a lot of interconnecting cable uh, that goes between all the equipment, uh, if you build a, the, the way the code is written, it says, if you build a room to meet these following six things, you can then take advantage of the provisions of this article. If you decide not to take, build, do these six things and not to take advantage of these uh, other provisions of this article, then the, the requirements of chapters one through four general requirements still apply. So basically, 645 says, you do these six things. It allows you to do these special things in this room that typically chapters one through four would not allow. Gotcha. So you can still have an information technology equipment space uh, and not necessarily do the six things that are listed in Article 645. And it doesn't change the purpose of the space or the function of the space. It just means that there you have to uh, abide by the general requirements of cabling as opposed to the special provisions allowed in the cabling. Right. So I, I, I kind of somewhat know what those six things are because I did kind of look through it. The first one that, that kind of sparked my interest is an auxiliary disconnecting means. So what exactly is that? Well, common layman's term is an EPO, right? The emergency power off switch. It's the big red button that uh, every good uh, computer room operator will tell you. You go near that button unless you see flames and you're fired and you'll never be in here again <laughs> because that's the emergency power off button that basically shuts down all power to all equipment inside the computer room. Gotcha, gotcha. And I know the telecom rooms, I know the Bixie TDMM says that you're supposed to have your own dedicated HVAC. Is that the same thing for the information technology equipment room? I don't think so. You know, uh, I think uh, when we're looking for a dedicated HVAC in our telecom rooms is because we have a specific load in that room. And if you have your HVAC in your comm room connected to the same HVAC system as the rest of the space, uh, if you lose that HVAC in the general purpose space, uh, your equipment's gonna overheat in your comm room and then your equipment's gonna die. And you still may need data processing and data communications or communications, period, uh, going through those uh, TRs, regardless of if you have an office space that's operating or not. Whereas in a computer room, you are isolating the HVAC to basically contain any type of, of incident or smoke or fire within that room so it doesn't affect the rest of the building or exterior spaces. So I would say that the reason for a dedicated uh, HVAC system, they're primarily two, two different. There can be some overlap, but you're probably, you're coming from two different perspectives. Well, well, since you said smoke, you know, I got to go down the whole UL thing. 
In the ITE, is it required to use UL listed equipment? Yes. Yes. Uh, so UL listed, so we're talking about cable that's UL listed. You're talking about uh, equipment that has uh, a UL listing to it and, and, and so forth. So it, it's equipment that has been tested. You know, in the, in the UL testing uh, basically is as testing for safety, right? It says this equipment is designed to work within certain parameters uh, without necessarily catching on fire or causing some type of a hazard. Right. Yeah, that's just one of the things I harp on in every single class. I harp on the word listed and the word labeled <laughs> because they're similar, but they're not necessarily the same. So, uh, you know, paraphrasing what listed means, it's a product or service that has been proved by the authority having jurisdiction that meets certain flame and smoke propagations as tested by NRTL, doesn't say UL, it says NRTL, a nationally recognized testing laboratory. And right. UL is an example of an NRTL. So, so once UL says, yes, it's good to go, then it's on the list to be put inside the building for those who And there's some it. sharp folks out there that will, that will recognize that we use the word listed. Uh, the way UL uses the word quote unquote listed as part of their levels of certification may be slightly different as the word is used in the code as UL listed in that uh, UL and it shows up on a, something that is a list of things that are approved. Subtle difference, same term. Right, exactly. So you mentioned data center and, and computer room. Every data center, every computer room that I've always been in, there's people inside of them, people in there who are, who are maintaining or operating that those systems. Um, what does the what does the 645 article say about those particular people? Well, it basically says uh, one of the provisions uh, to do the special cabling that's going to be allowed is that the only people allowed in those rooms are the people that are supposed to be there. And, and so you would not have, say, general office space in as part of the computer room um, so that you can do the special cabling say throughout your entire building so the only people that can be in there are people doing maintenance or people doing operations at the data center now you can have a war room in there you can have an operators you know a full-time operator sitting in those rooms that's allowed if you were to look at articles uh excuse me nfpa 75 in the in the annex you'll see some diagrams of uh, of some information technology spaces they're antiquated. They're very old. They remind you of some 1960s, 1970s computer rooms, you know, uh, but uh, you'll see that there's, you actually can have some office, but those are for the dedicated people that work in there. General people, accounting, for example, and those other type of uh, engineers that don't necessarily have anything to do with the computer room directly, they have to be on the outside. Gotcha. So I guess, I guess they assume that the people inside the data center are expendable, <laughs> I guess. No, I don't think it's expendable. I think what they're trying to do is limit, limit exposure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. You know, here's, you know, we're talking about special provisions. We're talking about special equipment. Uh, we have a big old red EPO switch right by the door. So you really want to limit the people in that room that are trained to be in that room. And I would say the general business population that work in an office environment won't necessarily have that training. That's true. That's absolutely true. Because especially with Halon and fire suppression systems, most people go through at least some kind of training on, on once, once this, once this switch gets hit and this light starts spinning, you have X amount of time to get out of Dodge before you have problems. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so we, since we're talking about fire, um, what, it, what, does it require fire rated walls? Is there a minimum or is there a maximum? What's it talk about net for ITE? There is a there is a, a requirement that the whole space that makes up this information technology equipment room space, the computer room space, has to be wrapped in a fire rated wall system. So it's completely self-contained. Right. So you've isolated the power. Uh, you can't run power through that uh, space that doesn't serve the space. You can't run HVAC that serves both this space and the outside space. And you basically have cocooned your uh, computer room in a rated assembly. Now, remember this is the rated uh, walls is not there necessarily to protect the equipment. Right. It's really there to protect the rest of the building from the equipment. 
just like you're isolated in mechanical um, air, you're basically, if there's a fire, you're protecting the rest of the space on the outside of the computer room from any type of smoke that may come from this right. area that has a very high density of electronic equipment and cabling. So people have time to egress and get out of the building. So on, on a side note, so if a because you this just this question just hit me as we were talking, if a piece of equipment catches on fire, right, is inside of that and you may or may not know the answer to this question, the equipment's on fire. What's inside of it? That's I mean I know with cabling it's the jack and it's dielectric, but what inside a piece of equipment that's going to cause such a concern for the code to be writing us about? Is it is it the circuit boards, the soldering? What what is it? There's all of that. There's all there's all these rare earth metals. There is chemicals, there's, you know, all the things in, uh, that, that go into making electronics that you just don't want to breathe because they are toxic um, and you don't want that in the airflow system. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, you want to contain it. You know, there's sometimes we put in rated walls to protect things uh, from what's ever within that space. And sometimes we put in rated walls to literally protect that space from the outside. Right. In this case here, uh, we're primarily protecting everything. Uh, we're containing this space for, uh, uh, to protect it from the rest of the building, or excuse me, to protect the rest of the building from this space. Yeah, yeah actually, a, a question I get quite often, and when I say often, I mean, I get at least once or twice a month. Chuck, do I have to fire stop a wall if I, if I penetrate under a raised floor? Because smoke rises, it doesn't it does knock down. Yes. Yes, it's a, yes. it's a architectural assembly that's got to be brought back to its original rating. So, yes, you got to do it. And you got to put it in per the UL drawing, because if you don't, then it's not a listed system. That's where the term listed comes back to play and bites us in the butt. Um, I like how you said when you talked about the electrical wiring running through the room, if it goes through the room, it's got to be for that room. It can't just be passing through. Um, what if, because we all know this, especially, you know, customers are always looking for places to put additional equipment and stuff. So what about electrical panels and stuff? If they're, if they're not serving that particular room, are they required to, are not required to be in there or, or restricted from being in there? You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, sidestep questions on power. Cause you know, I really don't focus a lot on power. Gotcha. And so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sidestep that one. No problem. Well, hey, you're nailing every other one. So I don't blame you at all. Don't blame you at all. So uh, what is the, uh, what's so special about this article that if we provide the room, that it meets those six previous things. Well, here's the, here's the advantage. Uh, you know, if uh, if you have the rated walls, you have the isolated air handling system. You have a way to immediately turn off the power. You've limited the uh, number of people, and uh, you're putting in listing components. And this uh, additional uh, item that was added in uh, the 2020 code of having a, a dedicated fire suppression system is you can actually put non-plenum cable in a plenum space. Specifically, you can put non-plenum cable in the raised access floor space in your computer room. That's, that's what this is about. Now, there's also some power things that I don't wanna talk about, such as being able to put power receptacles under the floor and such like that and, and special cordage. Uh, I won't get into the power side, but when it comes to the telecom side, our data cabling, our fiber optic cabling, it allows us to put in riser rated or general purpose cable in that floor, raised access floor space that's actually being used as a supply plenum to the computers. That's the special provision. And as you know, in a computer room, there is a tremendous amount of cabling between the network switches and routers to all the servers. So there's a huge advantage of meeting all those six requirements in that I can bring down the cost of my, my cabling inside a computer room. Very cool. Now, let me ask you this, how would a technician who may or may not be so fluent with the code, may, may not be able to look at those six items. If I'm a technician out in the field and I wanna know if I can run riserated cable underneath that floor and I, wanna, and I, I need to know if it's an IT equipment room or not, what would be the, the, the easiest or maybe the most accurate, accurate way for me to be able to determine that? If it's a uh, building that's currently under construction, talk to the architectural team. They have done already done a code analysis and there's gonna be a code analysis drawing that they would have had to submit for part of permitting for that, uh, that space. And they'll be able to tell you and work with the electrical because we're also talking about you know, the electrical classification here. 
is they'll be able to tell you whether that art, that room was designed in Article 645. If this is an existing computer room, then you have to talk to the owner. You know, the owner is the one that's responsible for meeting the code requirements of their building. And uh, they'll be able to tell you, or they should be able to tell you, if that room was built to Article 645 such that you can put non-plenum cable under that floor. Gotcha. And I would highly suggest that you document any conversation along those lines if you start putting riser ready cable underneath the floor, because if it turns out not to be an ITE room, there could be some real some real potential problems there for, for the installers. So in Article 645, there's a definition for electrical classification of data circuits. What the heck is that? Well, this goes back to uh, this is, goes back to a discussion we had uh, maybe our first discussion on whether data cables are covered under Article Six for uh, Article Eight Hundred, or they're they're covered elsewhere, which they're actually covered under Article Seven Twenty Five. So, what we see is Article Six Forty Five is about data processing rooms, computer rooms, information technology equipment spaces, which do data processing. Well, you have to get that data out. And so, uh, and there's data going between the servers and the equipment. And so what you literally have is, here's the definition of a data circuit. And um, let's see, do I have that in front of me here? You know, I don't know if I have that in front of me here, Chuck, but uh, yeah, right here. It says uh, electrical classification of data circuits. This is under the definitions, by the way, of article 645. Section 725.121, paragraph A, subparagraph four, shall apply to the electrical classifications of listed information technology equipment signaling circuits. That right there tells you that data circuits are covered under Article 725, specifically subparagraph A4. And when you go over to Article 725, uh, the definition is, <clears throat> Listed audio slash video, comma, information technology, computer, comma, communications and industrial equipment limited power circuits. So right there is what you have is that's the link between data circuits are one, there's a definition in Article 645 that there are uh, data circuits are seven are covered under 725. And then when you go look at 725, it talks about the circuits for information technology computer equipment. Very cool. You are the man. You just seem to know everything, man. Except for, well, you probably know the power thing. You're probably just staying away from that conversation because there's somebody out there who probably would catch us on. So well, you, you, you mentioned that 645 allows us to put non-plenum cable underneath the floor, even if it's a plenum rated area. Yeah. What if I'm putting, can I put non-plenum cable in a plenum ceiling in the data center if it meets those six requirements for an ITE? No, you cannot. <clears throat> oh. This provision is strictly limited to under the raised access floor. If you have an art of, uh, in the 2020 code, they added an additional paragraph to explain that if you have other plenum spaces or what we would call article 300.22C, uh, other, places, other places used for environment, transport of environmental air, if you have any of those spaces, in addition to the raised access floor, those other spaces, you still have to meet the requirements of Article 725 or Article 770 for a plenum space, uh, which all fall under Article 300.22C for plenum spaces. So no, if you these other spaces, you still have to put plenum rated cable in those other plenum spaces. Okay, so I get that, but you gotta pardon me. I'm just no cable guy. I, I pull cable. <laughs> This doesn't make sense to me because if we've got a, a a completely sealed off room with fire rated architectural assemblies and it's got a ceiling inside of it where's that where's that smoke gonna go if it's why can't i why can't i why why why, why wouldn't it apply for both why why the, why the segregation you know i don't know i don't have an answer i don't sit on the code panels i i don't have an answer but um evidently the code panel had enough reason of concern that when we went from the 2017 code to the 2020 code, they started making it very clear uh, that these other spaces, 
you cannot put uh, this provision, these provisions for non plenum cable uh, doesn't apply to those other spaces. Okay, very good. So again, every time I talk to you, Tim, I learned something new. <laughs> Actually, I learned more than one thing new today talking to you. And the thing, the takeaway that I got from today's show is if it meets the six requirements of an information technology equipment room and it's a plenum rated raised floor, you can put riser rated cable in that environment, but you can't do it if it's in the ceiling and it's a plenum rated ceiling. But here's the key. You may not want to. True. Oh, absolutely true. There's, so, there's, there's let me ask examples. you why first. Well, one, uh, say you don't have a raised access floor. Do Ooh. you still want to go through all the steps of those six provisions? And those are costly. Now, the, the, the local uh, inspector might require it. It may be good prudence. It may be good engineering practice to say, you know, we still want to isolate this room and the equipment to protect the other spaces. <clears throat> um, but uh, why would you, uh, if you're not going to take advantage of the non uh cabling under the floor, so it's going to save you a ton of money because you have no raised access floor, then why would you want to follow all the requirements of Article 645? Yeah, I didn't even think about that because I'm so used to always seeing data centers with raised floor. I forgot that there are some without them. On the hyperscale side, on the very large purpose-built data centers, uh, where you're not talking about just a computer room in an office, but you're talking about uh, you know facilities that are built just as data centers, uh, I rarely ever see a raised access floor. Hmm. You know, raised access floors are basically an impediment to uh, good airflow, and they cost money. Right. So, so. On, on, on a different subject, which doesn't really deal with Article 645, because one of the things that we teach quite often in my daily class that I teach for my day job, we talk about hot aisle and cold aisles, and that whole is, is, is configuration. That whole configuration is based on cold air running underneath the floor, pushing the hot air up through the equipment, through the holes or the perforated tiles to get the hot air out of the equipment. So how do they dissipate heat if they don't have a raised floor? Well, how do they get the cold air to go into the cabinets? Well, that's one way to do it, right? Uh, I mean, that's one way to do it. But, you know, even in a hot aisle, cold aisle with raised access floors, typically in the cold aisle, you're percolating that air up through the tiles in front of the cabinets. And then it gets drawn through the servers and then it gets exhausted on the hot side, on the back side of the cabinets. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be ducted up underneath the floor. What you can do is, and we've seen the mechanical systems where you just duct it in from the top and you dump the cold air in the top and it still gets drawn through the front of the cabinets. So you're not relying on the bottom opening of the server cabinet to draw the cold air in. In fact, that's a horrible place to pull the air in because you get typically have a server the size of a pizza box filling up that entire space. That's right. blocking the air. What you want to do is bring all that air through that large door in the front and whether you percolate that air up through the bottom through these little holes or just dump it in from the top through some large ducts, you'll find that um, uh, that you can get more airflow through the large ducts without those little holes that you have to walk on uh, than you can if um, you know through any other type of solution. So, yeah, in these large data centers, we we typically don't see any raised access floor. That makes sense. That makes sense. Any parting words of wisdom for about Article Six Forty Five? Uh, the only other one is. Just because Article 645 says you can put in non-plenum cable in a plenum space, when you start getting into the hyperscale and large, very large data centers, there are other requirements out there in the industry that might actually tell you that you can't do that. So for example, when we get to large purpose-built data centers, we're looking at uh, other directors, other directions such as Factory Mutual or FM Global. They have a directive out there that basically says for data center facilities, all data, all data communications cables will be plenum rated. And that's regardless if it's in a plenum or even in a general purpose space. So just like we look at codes as having an influence on what you have to do and uh, for uh, the design of the facility and the construction, there are also other factors out there, such as um, fact, uh, underwriters and basically the insurers of these large facilities that may also say to reduce risk, right. you have to take this different approach. Oh, that makes absolute sense because they're the ones that got to write the check if, if it catches on fire. 
And I remember in a class a long, long time ago, I mean, I'm talking like maybe even two decades ago, they were, they were talking about um, smoke in data centers. And of course, they're referring to the old hard drives back then. Now we got our solid state you know, drives and stuff. But they said that smoke is inherently really bad for, the, for a hard drive because the smoke particles get on the platters and that causes all kinds of problems. So I could certainly understand why somebody's going to write. It's like the hospital inspections. They got to go through their, their yearly inspections for their insurance. So that makes absolute sense. We, we, we often design data centers with an early warning smoke detection system that can, uh, I mean, these are not just your little, you know, smoke detectors that you see here and there. I mean, these are, you know, the, uh, the tubes with uh, sampling tubes that have holes every so many feet that just get the slightest whiff of smoke and tell you that something's going on. And those are so important because, you know, one, not only do you not want something to get out of hand, uh, you don't want the fire to spread to affect equipment that's not necessarily um, having an electrical issue. I um, mean, do it sometime. Talk to Dell. Talk to uh, you know one of the Cisco. Talk to any of them. Say, hey, I had a I had a small fire in my computer room. Will that affect the warranty of my equipment that was in a separate cabinet? And they'll tell you. You know, uh, smoke is bad. It's corrosive. It will uh, even though uh, it won't cause the equipment to fail immediately. It may cause equipment to fail um, in a few weeks or a few months because of right. the corrosive nature of the smoke if it starts pulling that stuff in. And according to Murphy's Law, it was going to fail at the least opportune moment. So right when there's like the heaviest load or I was, I was trying to get on GoTo training yesterday for, for class I was teaching and their servers were down. So the most inopportune time for their servers to be down was oh, when yeah. I was trying to get on it. So yeah. Well, I appreciate your input, Tim. And uh, it's always fun, Chuck. And we're going to have to have you back on for another subject because you're just a wealth of information. I love people who can teach me, and you're definitely one of them. So I appreciate you being on here today. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Until next time, everybody, be safe. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.